Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, again for uh, a wonderful time of worship and celebration and praise. Thank you for all you've done, for all you've given, Father. Thank you for the Bible, the absolute truth, Lord, that we live our lives by. I pray as we open your truth this morning, Father, you'd speak to us very clearly, challenge us, transform us, Father, more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles home to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58. As you're finding Isaiah 58, I just want to ask you to kind of be in prayer and, and be thinking about the summer that's ahead. You know, once we get past Easter, kind of the next big thing for us, there's a lot of things upcoming, but summer is on the horizon. And I tell people, I joke with people that for us at least, summer's the busiest time of year. There are more things going on during the summer really than any other time. Mission trips, we've got over 120 people right now going on short-term mission this summer, which is fantastic. Uh, really all over the world, Africa, going up to Alaska, Central America. So you be in prayer for those people, obviously, that are going. That does not include all the people that are going to serve at Rockridge. It doesn't include all the people that will serve at Viola. It do doesn't include all the people that serve at VBS. So just a lot of opportunities a lot of things going on, a, a lot of chances for us to spread the gospel, uh, to love people in the name of Jesus. And so you be in prayer for that. You be in prayer for our church and for all the people that have already signed up. You be in prayer that maybe the Lord would call you to be a part of something going on this summer, uh, some local ministry maybe that you can serve in. But we just want the Lord to do great things. We want to reach people. Uh, we want the message of Christ to be made known and summer's a great time to do it. So you be in prayer for that and be involved as much as you can. Now, we're kind of winding down our sermon series. Uh, we've been in the book of Isaiah now for a period of several months, studying, working through. Uh, I pray that it's challenged you. I pray you've learned from it. Uh, I pray that your faith has grown because of it. And, and so uh, I just want to kind of encourage you as we get here towards the end of this book uh, to remember all the Lord has shown us, all the prophecies of Jesus, uh, all the things that Isaiah has, has talked about, all the, the calling of repentance. We've seen that time and time again. And as we kind of get towards the end here, Isaiah's moving kind of into this idea a little more of, of how we can live on a day-by-day -day basis for the Lord, how we can trust him, how we can live for him. And this morning, something a little bit different, something very challenging there's this call to be real in our faith, right? So to kind of prepare your hearts a little bit where we're going, uh, we pretend a lot of times to be religious. The Lord's going to call us to be real. All right, so let's jump right in this morning. Isaiah chapter 58, beginning in verse 1. Right, Isaiah wants the people to know this is important. So he begins, cry out loud, cry aloud, don't hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, right? Don't, don't whisper this. Don't be quiet about this. Let people know. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sin, right? So the Lord wants the people to know about this. He wants them to hear this. He wants the voice to be loud like a trumpet so there's no question. There's no confusion. It's very clear. Verse 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to me. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord. And let's stop there just for a second. I want to give you kind of the first truth, but it's really foundational to everything else Isaiah is going to say here. So everything we're going to say after this point kind of builds on this idea. Truth number one, God calls us to more than just outward religion. 
God calls us to more than just outward religion. Now, this isn't a subtle message. This isn't a message that needs to be whispered in back rooms, right? This is a message that needs to be heard. And so Isaiah begins, cry aloud, don't hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, right? People need to be confronted with this truth. And then he kind of gets into the idea of what's going on here. Here's the heart of what's happening. Look at verse 2. It starts good. All right, verse 2 starts strong. These are people that seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. But midway through verse 2, there are two words that change everything here. As if. So they're seeking me daily. They delight to know my ways. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Right? Isaiah is describing people here that outwardly seem very serious about their faith, but inwardly they're empty, they're far from the things of the Lord. So they seek me and they cry to me as if they were people that were serious about their faith, as if they were people that were being real with me, as if they really, truly desired to know me more. See, the Lord's calling these people to more than just outward religion. Now, now, we're good at kind of faking things, aren't we? Like, we're good at knowing all the right answers. We're, we're good at walking to our, our life group and understanding kind of the game, understanding how it works, saying the right things, doing the right things, maybe putting on airs would be a way we could say it. We're, we're really good at kind of this outward appearance. The question is, what's really going on in our hearts? Because if you're kind of faking it, if you're pretending one thing and actually thinking or living something differently, you're not pleasing the Lord. Right? True spirituality is not about acting religious. It's actually about loving the Lord. And those can be very different things oftentimes. Now, we see this in other parts of Scripture. In fact, this is one of the things that Jesus talked a lot about with the Pharisees, right? the religious leaders of his day. And so we see verses like Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. He's speaking to these leaders. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He uses the word here, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, our Christian walk becomes this. If we're not careful and guarded and serious, our Christian walk becomes people that seem eager to know the Lord, that seem eager to draw close to Him, that know all the right answers and say all the right things, when in fact we're far too selfish to really trust the Lord with all of our lives. We're far too selfish to really love Him with all of our heart, heart mind, soul, and strength. And so we kind of come to this place in, in Scripture where we're, we're being exposed here, so to speak. Right? I, I, our selfishness is being exposed. And Isaiah is calling these people out. And Isaiah is reminding them of their transgressions. He's reminding them. He's crying aloud of their sin. He's reminding them of their selfishness and how they're far too interested in doing what they want to do as opposed to the things that the Lord wants them to do. I'll never forget years ago reading a book by Ted Tripp. Paul David Tripp and Ted Tripp, right? You guys probably know them. Brothers uh, have written extensively. Ted Tripp is the guy that wrote Shepherding a Child's Heart, which Amy and I, it's one of our favorite parenting books. Uh, read it years ago. It still resonates with us. But in one of his books, I'll never forget him talking about the selfishness of the heart. And at the time, he'd been married to his wife, I don't know, 30, 40 years, a long time. And he said they were in bed one night. She said, you know, honey, I would sure like some ice cream, to which he responded, honey, I'd love to get you some ice cream, which is the answer, by the way, all the time, husbands, right? We all know that. So he gets up, he says he goes downstairs, he fixes a couple bowls of ice cream, and he says, 
as I'm walking up the stairs, I've been married to this woman 30 years. I've given her my life. As I'm walking up the stairs, he said I was weighing the bowls to see which one had more ice cream because that's the one I was going to keep. I was like, I get it. I get it. That, that, that really resonated with me, right? We're, we're, we're selfish people if we're not careful, right? Here's the problem with our selfishness, right? When we're selfish and we do what we want, God's got, not going to use us in the way that he really wants to use us. He can't. He, he doesn't want us to be fake and selfish and pretend outwardly to be one person and internally to be somebody else. He wants everything about who we are. And so if you're just kind of playing this game, right, this is a wake-up call to what the Lord really wants to do in your heart. Because I want you to notice what happens in verse 3. Because these people are pretending as if they were righteous, as if they really loved him, as if they were really willing to give him everything. These people are pretending, and then God is not doing the things in their life that they expect. Look at verse 3. They're asking this question. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Right? They're like, God, you're not working in our lives the way we think you should. You're not doing the things in our lives we think you should do. You're not taking notice of our fast. You're not taking notice of our outward religion. You're not working in our lives the way that we think you ought to work. See, here's the problem. A lot of times we see the Lord as a vending machine in the sky. And we think there's this transactional process that takes place, right? As long as I put my money in, as long as I give the Lord a little bit of worship time and, and maybe I'm going to raise my hand in worship or maybe I'm going to go to life group or maybe I'm going to read my Bible a few times this week or maybe I'm going to say some prayers or maybe I'm going to give a little bit of money. There's this transaction we expect to happen. If I do these things for the Lord, I expect something in return. Like I put money in the vending machine, I expect not to get a Coke back, right? And when I don't get a Coke, what do I do? Start shaking the machine, right? And hope nobody's looking, right? Because we want back after we put in. We think the Lord's like that. He's not. He's not this vending machine where we make a payment and God gives us back the goods, right? These people believed that their religious behavior would lead to some sort of a blessing from the Lord. Here's the biblical truth we need to get. Only when we surrender our self-interest, only when we surrender our pride and what we want, can we then receive the free blessing that the Lord desires to give to us. Like if you think you can do enough stuff to get some things back, if you think you can pretend enough or play the game long enough and get the things back, you're mistaken. Like the Lord's not going to answer your cries. The Lord's not going to hear you when you're pretending to be one thing, when you're really doing something different in your heart. Here's how one writer explained it. He said, repentance is not for the purpose of getting God to do anything. It is an expression of the conviction that my ways are wrong and God's ways are right, whether he does anything for me or not. If you're kind of in this transactional place in your faith where you're going to do and you expect God to do, you're missing the truth. The idea is we should be willing to give all regardless of what it costs and regardless of what we get back. Like there's this idea, Lord, I love you enough that I'm going to give and serve you regardless of what I get back because you're God and you're worthy of my praise. But when we play this game, man, we do this outward stuff, and on the inside we're empty, the Lord takes note, and the Lord understands, and we realize this is not going to get us what we want. Now I want you to notice what happens in verse 4. I want you to notice the response of what the Lord says here. He says in verse 4, right, they're, they're far from him. They're pretending as if they're righteous. They're not really. They're asking him, why, why are we not hearing from you, verse 3? We're doing these things. Why are you not responding? Look at verse 4. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. All right, when you fake it and you're selfish and you're doing it only for what you hope to gain, 
the Lord's not going to hear that. The Lord's not going to work in your life, right? So, so don't expect to, to, the Lord to, to do great things in your life when all you're doing is thinking about yourself. Right? Don't expect the Lord to, to answer the prayers of your heart when you're only doing it for your personal gain, right? But we, we get to this place where, where the world is just so busy and, and fast-paced that, that we buy into this lie. Like the more stuff I can do, the more boxes I can check, uh, the more successful I'm going to be, right? We do that at work. Uh, we do that in our personal life. And oftentimes we do that in our walk with the Lord. Like the more Bible studies I can go to, the more blanks I can fill in, uh, the more prayers I can have, the more things I can do, the busier I am, the more the Lord's going to bless me. Instead, we see that sometimes we just need to be still and know that he's God. It's not a transaction, it's a relationship. It's not about what can I get, it's about how much can I really love? How much can I trust you, Father? How much can I be real about my faith? So he doesn't want outward religion. He wants true heart change. Now look at verse 6. Look at where he goes from here. Is not this the fast that I choose? So the Lord's already said to them, listen, you're faking it as if you really love me. You're fasting, but you're selfish. You're doing it for your own good. When you do that, I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to do the things you want me to do. So here's the answer. Is not this the fast that I choose? Right. So here's what the Lord wants us to do. To loose the bonds of wickedness to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide himself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday, right? So there's this idea, we, we, we got to stop faking it. We've got to stop pretending. It's really a heart issue for us. It's not so much about the things we say and do. It's more about how we love the Lord in our hearts. Truth number one, and now number two, right? God calls us to spend ourselves for the poor and the needy. God calls ourselves to spend ourselves for the poor and the needy. Now, Isaiah is talking here about fasting. And this isn't a sermon on fasting, but, but I wanted to take just a minute to kind of explain what fasting is, right? Fasting is usually where we stop eating food for a period of time in order to focus on our growth and our walk with the Lord. And so we would use the time that we would normally eat to pray, or we would use the time we would normally eat to spend time in God's Word. And, and it does several things for us. One of the things it does is it gives us just a just a little bit of feeling of suffering. Because we're not used to going without meals, amen? I'm not. And so when I go without a meal or two or three, the, the pains of hunger and the headache and the, 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 the physical uh, pain that I feel, it's just a, just a tiny little piece of suffering, right? We're doing that for Jesus. It helps us deepen our faith. It helps us deepen our walk. It helps us to, to realize that we don't live on bread alone, right? But it's about trusting him. It's about hearing from him. And typically we fast on food, but you can really fast on anything. Maybe, maybe social media would be a good thing to fast on, right? Or, or television or, or whatever you're putting ahead of the Lord, right? But, but fasting helps us focus on the things of the Lord. But these people, when they're, when they're fasting, they're, they're really focusing on the wrong things. In fact, we see that right there in verse 4, right? When you fast, you do it to quarrel and to fight. You hit with a wicked fist, right? Fasting like yours will not make your voice to be heard on high, right? They're, they're selfish. They're fasting for the wrong reasons. But he gives them the contrast, right? Verse 6 is kind of filled with this idea of what you should be doing. You should loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the straps of the yoke, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke, 
Verse 7, share your bread. Bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see somebody naked, cover them. The idea is, look, hey, we need to get our eyes off ourselves and our selfishness and put them on somebody in need. We need to quit thinking about so much about ourselves and the image that we're projecting to other people. And we need to think more about how we can serve and love other people. How can we take our eyes off ourselves and put them on others? And then notice what happens. When you begin to think about people that are needy, when you begin to think about the oppressed, when you begin to share your bread and bring people into your home and cover people that don't have anything, verse 8 begins with this word, then... Right? When you do that, then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then the same word again in verse 9. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Right? We, we have this pattern here. We have this model. We have this teaching that if we'll just stop thinking about ourselves and pretending and faking, if we'll just take our eyes off of ourselves and put them on somebody else, the Lord will bless us and use us. Then our light will break forth. Then the Lord will answer, here I am. Now, here's the problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of give you a real simple explanation of what's happening here, and I'm going to tell you what you probably struggle with and you may not even have known until right now. Most people, myself included, and probably you, most people give out of their abundance. I want you to think about that just for a minute. What that means is, hey, as long as I got enough food at my house and in my pantry and I've eaten plenty today and I know where my next several meals are coming from, as long as I got plenty for me and mine, I'm willing to give you something. As long as I've bought everything that I need and usually everything that I want, then whatever's left over, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of it. I'm willing to come and do some things and serve, give you a little bit of my time. As long as all my to-do list is checked off, I've got all the things done that I need to do, right? We, we give usually out of abundance. But I want you to look at the phrase that Isaiah uses in verse 10. It's important for us to get here the heart of where he's coming from. He says in verse 10, if you pour yourself out. He doesn't say if you give out of your abundance or if you have something left over, give it. He says if you pour yourself out. There's something kind of baked into the DNA of Scripture of giving to this point that sometimes it actually costs us something. And when all we're ever doing is just kind of giving out of our abundance and watch now, we're doing it because we know other people are watching. Maybe we're missing the truth here. And we wonder why the Lord's not at work. And we wonder why he's not doing miraculous things. And we wonder why he's not using us to accomplish great purposes. Man, how, how often, how much, When's the last time you actually poured yourself out for somebody in need? I'll never forget when I was in college. I did the college summer jobs like so many, some of you guys are probably going to do this summer. You got a job lined up. I get it. I worked at Canal Fiberglass one summer, right? Matt Donette and I, I don't know if Matt, Matt's probably in the back. Matt sang this morning. His dad was a plant manager. Dad got us a job. We were the temps. That's a rough job as a temp in a, in a fiberglass manufacturing plant because a couple of things was number one there was no air in the building it was like 115 degrees probably if you've ever touched fiberglass you know how it makes you itch a little bit if you're not careful imagine just working in it the whole summer right and you had to wear long sleeves long pants gloves something covering your head or else it just got in all your pores it got in everything anyway so I spent the whole summer itching I just itched all summer and I can remember the guys on the floor there was like a debate it was kind of the cold shower versus the hot shower. Some guys said, man, you take a cold shower uh, because it does something and it gets the stuff out and you want itch. And then there was a whole other group said, no, 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 you, you got to take a hot shower. If you take a hot shower. So I did both, man. I get home, I take a cold shower, then a hot shower because I just didn't want to itch. But I can remember coming home and just sweating through all my clothes, 
itching. You know, you get the job in the summer oftentimes, so you're reminded of how much you want to go back to school. I'm telling you, everybody needs one of those jobs in their life. I'm just telling you. You need to have a job that at some point you're like, I can't, I can't wait for classes to start back in the fall, man. I, sitting in some AC with a bottle of water, listening to some lady talk for an hour is worth it, right? I'm happy to do it. That was the job for me. But I can remember coming home every day that summer and just being spent. Like I, I didn't have anything else to give. I, I, I didn't want to go do anything. I, I didn't want to see any friends. You know, so when I, when I read these verses, I think about that kind of thing. Like, like what am I doing now? What, what am I giving in my life? How am I spending myself for the things of the Lord? Right? How am I spending myself and, and giving every ounce of who I am for the glory of the Lord? Or am I just giving out of my abundance? Right, James 1, 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Our our call is to give. Our our call is to sacrifice. Our our call is to serve. Our our call is to be real about our faith. Not not to put on airs and and to pretend like we're somebody that we're not. You know, there there are great examples in Scripture of of people that give. We, We send people to India on a regular basis. And if you're interested in going, I'd love to talk to you. But we send people there to work. And every time I go, it's, it's just fascinating to me. The culture is so radically different than here. The poverty is so radically different than here. We see the same thing in Guatemala, abject poverty. There's still leper colonies in India, by the way. They still exist. And, you know, you read the history of, of India and the people that have gone and, like, Mother Teresa, the things that she gave, right? Now, I know she's not Baptist, but we still use her as an illustration, so it's okay, Right? Because she gave a lot. And she won the Nobel Peace Prize in the late 70s. Right? She spent 50 years in India living among the poor. And when she won the Nobel Peace Prize, instead of taking the banquet and the $190 plus thousand dollar prize that came with it, she gave it all to the poor. I'm not sure I could do that. If you want to write me a $190,000 check today, we'll try it and we'll just see. I'm not sure I could give that away. She did, right? I think about the people in our world who've given and poured out, and and then I think about Jesus. I wonder where my life would be right now if Jesus had given out of his abundance. I wonder where my life would be right now if Jesus hadn't sacrificed it all. I think about verses like Titus 2.14, speaking about Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from sin and lawlessness and to purify us for himself a people, for his own possession. Galatians 1, 3 and following, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, be imitators of God therefore as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. There's this calling time and time again to, to give to be real, to trust the Lord, to pour yourself out for the sake of his kingdom. You say, how do I do that, right? What's the application here? There's a million applications for you. But I, I can't go through all the applications in your life, all the different ways that this can be used. But I'm just telling you, if you'll understand this teaching, first of all, because the tendency is going to be for us to go home and just sweep this under the rug. Uh-huh. Pour myself out, sacrifice, give until it hurts. Let's just put that under the rug. We'll talk about that later, right? That's somebody else's job. I'm not going to worry about it. Don't do that. Let it rattle around in your brain a little bit. Talk about it at lunch. Challenge yourself a little bit more, right? So understand the teaching. Then you ought to start praying about sacrifice. It's amazing. When you start asking the Lord to give you opportunities to do things for his glory, he's going to give them to you. I promise you he will. So you start studying this, you start reading it a little bit more, you you let it kind of rattle around a little bit in your head, and then you start praying, Lord, give me opportunities to actually do this. Give me a chance, Lord, to really sacrifice. Show show me a situation or put somebody in my heart, put somebody on my mind where I, I can really sacrifice. And then when the Lord does it, find the strength and the courage to actually follow what he's calling you to do. You'll be amazed at how he'll use you. So he's calling us, listen, don't, don't be faking your walk. Don't just be religious. 
Don't be selfish. Don't, don't just think about yourself. Pour yourself out for others. Pour yourself out for those people in need. And then verse 10, I want you to notice what happens, right? Verse 10, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Now I want you to notice all the rest of this chapter, all the things that are going to happen. Then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually. He will satisfy your desire in scorched places. Make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right? Stop faking it. Be real. Pour yourself out. Give to those in need. Truth number three, God calls now our light to shine. When we're willing to do these things, the Lord says, our light will rise. Gloom will be as the noonday. You know, there, there are a lot of people in our world that struggle with a lot of things. I had a conversation recently, recently with, with a trained counselor, and this person was telling me most of the things they deal with right now with people are about anxiety, about depression. I know that's real. I know there are people that need that. I know there, there are people that struggle with that in a, in a very real way. But I can't help but thinking how different our lives would be if, watch now, we stopped thinking so much about ourselves and put our eyes on other people. It's amazing what Scripture says here. And if you'll quit faking it and quit doing what you want to do, and turn your eyes to people that desperately need you, then your light's going to rise. Then your gloom will be as the noonday. Then you'll be like a watered garden, right? Verse 14, then you shall take delight in the Lord. There's this beautiful picture here that when we're willing to, to really follow the Lord, when we're willing to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? When we're willing to love our neighbor as ourselves, we're willing to do those things, the Lord does great things in our lives. So our prayer should be, Lord, let, let me take this teaching seriously. Let, let me live it out in my life. Let, let me live it out in our church. Lord, do great things. Hear us. Use us to accomplish things. Use us to impact, Lord, not only this area, but the world. Because when we truly trust the Lord and follow him, he uses us in ways that we cannot even fathom for his honor and for his glory. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for a clear teaching, a challenging part of Scripture. Father, help us to, to, to repent of the ways in which we've faked our walk. Help us to be mindful, Father, of how to be real, of how to truly walk with you. Father, I pray that as we do that, we become more and more aware of the need around us, Father, of the suffering, the emotional, the spiritual, the, the physical suffering. Father, help us to be a part of that solution. Help us to be willing to, to give and to pour ourselves out for the sake of the kingdom. And then when we do those things, Father, let our light shine. Let people see and know all you've done for us. Do great things in our lives personally, do great things in our lives collectively as a church. And Father, we'll praise your name for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can stand, the altar is open, an opportunity for you to come and pray. You can speak to me, I'll be right down front. This is your chance to respond as we sing together.